frequency and, and more uh, frequent. You remember yesterday we discussed uh, the dimorphic blastomycosis, uh, which is a soil saprophyte, and whenever there's some disruption of the soil, individuals become infected. And then when we have a large number of people involved in some sort of environmental uh, excavation or disruption, then we get um, a um, group of people that are infected. They are not infected from each other. They're infected from the same point source. And the, the rest of these this morning, well, for the next hour anyway, are going to be very similar to that. The first one we'll discuss is uh, histoplasmosis, and then we'll discuss these others. The organism is Histoplasma capsulatum. It was named capsulatum because the pathologist who first saw this in Panama thought they had a capsule. It looks, it looks like there's a capsule around a very small yeast, but it's not a capsule, it's just shrinkage a natural shrinkage that this organism has that's different than the others. This is an intracellular mycosis. That means it grows within the cells, the uh, RE cells, and it attacks particularly the lung, liver, spleen. In children, you see liver and spleen infections. Uh, bone marrow is frequently because that's all RE cells and occasionally some of the other organs. Primarily, it's a disease of the lungs, a respiratory disease. And most of these people wound up in the uh, TB sanitarium uh, in, the, let's say, the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. And then radiologists started to be able to recognize this as a different entity. The Inoculation is similar, I told you, to blasto yesterday. There are lab accidents, pathologists doing an autopsy, vets cutting on dogs, and um, an occasional individual having some sort of trauma that inoculates the uh, organism. The, this is widespread in the eastern United States, and people will get an acute pulmonary infection, and it may be asymptomatic. It's like the flu. I had it myself. I thought it was the worst flu I ever had. And um, it, it spontaneously resolves. But some people get very symptomatic pulmonary symptoms. Some get the chronic pulmonary disease in which they may be a pulmonary cripple the rest of their life. And in others, it's disseminated, and without therapy, they die. The symptoms are shortness of breath, productive cough, anorexia, weight loss, night sweats. And what does that sound like? Sounds like TB. And that's where, like I said, most of them wound up, in a TB sanitarium. So it's up to you to think about histoplasmosis by some of the other items I'm going to be telling you about and the ecology and the nature and the distribution. A uh, chest x-ray can look horrible, uh, snowstorm, but uh, the radiologists are getting good at this. The ecological niche are bats and bat habitats, chicken houses. What we frequently see in South Carolina as uh, people take, get chicken manure and put it on their gardens, and in the process, uh, they inhale the spores and they become infected. Oh, let me dim the lights. This was our state epidemiologist many years ago, and the reason I'm showing you that is to get the size. That's cane break, and there are a lot of cane breaks in the northern part of the state. In the cane breaks, Blackbirds like to live in there, and the blackbirds, they roost there at night, and their droppings fertilize the soil, and that's where the organism grows. It grows in that soil. So whenever there's a, uh, uh, a disruption of this soil, then the uh, 
organism is uh, aerosolized. So you can see by his height how tall these things grow. Uh, okay, you can read that one. Here's the area pretty much east of the Mississippi and all up and down the United States, east of the Mississippi. There are some spots in a few other areas where it does occur also, but particularly in the eastern. Now, if you look at South Carolina here, uh, these studies were done in the 50s. These were uh, Navy recruits. All the Navy recruits, or most of them, used to go to the Great Lakes. And in the Great Lakes they, uh, Naval Station, they did these studies. They were mainly studying for tuberculosis at that time. And we were just starting to recognize the atypical mycobacteria. And that was the primary purpose of the study, but some mycologist stuck his nose in there and got him to do histoplasmin also. Histoplasmin uh, is a skin test for uh, histoplasmosis. And if you see here, it's the northwestern part of the state. And clinically and in the lab here, that's where we find most of the cases come from. This is histoplasma capsulatum. And, and uh, we've done a lot of sampling on this, environmental sampling. And as you can see, of course, we went to not just random sites, but sites that were likely uh, the, all the county health departments were, we had a big outbreak in 1968 up in Lawrence County, and after that all the health departments were trying to get us to test their areas. 18% of the sites were positive, and 13% of the samples were positive. Uh, the clinical specimens, again, like anything else, it's how is the disease presenting. Most of the time you're sending sputum. Bone marrow is here. It seems like um, Self Memorial Hospital, the techs there were very good at detecting this. They would see it in bone marrow very frequently if they did a bone marrow study. And they made the diagnosis and then told the physician what the disease was. Biopsy material is good, bronchial washings. Peripheral blood, I'll show you some pictures there. Uh, the textbooks all tell you they're picked up in the monocytes, but in my experience, and most of the experience here in South Carolina, we see them in polys. But anyway, the main thing is it's intracellular. And then gastric washings. Why gastric washings? Why would that be a source of organism? Somebody say something. Anything. What are gastric washings? Come from where? The stomach. From the stomach. Well, people, many people, cough up their sputum and then swallow it. And that's what I used to work at the state hospital in Milledgeville where the patients were not in very good shape. And we had 700 patients with TB, and we used to do gastric washings on them because they always swallowed their sputum. And that's where we got the vast majority, not from a sputum specimen, but from gastric washings. Now, here, see, these are polys. Okay? There's the nucleus of the cell. And there is a histoplasma capsulatum. They're small organisms. These are histo. All these are histoplasma here and down in here. They're all around six microns in diameter. Yes? If you find something, what? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's starting to disseminate, yes. But that's the nature of this. This the way this disease disseminates, in the blood mostly. Uh, get picked up by these cells and get distributed. I, I read the, the, that was amazing, those med techs up there. Just, and for a while, they were just picking them up left and right. Look. Yeah, there's a nice one. You see it's a poly. See the big nucleus? And, and you can see why they thought they had a capsule, but that's not really a capsule. That's just staining artifact. There's a big poly. Look at that one. Textbook picture. I'm getting trigger happy here. The fungus is dimorphic, right? We saw yeast in the cells. Now, here's the culture when you culture it 
at 25 degrees. That filling almost a whole petri plate is probably about four weeks old. It's a white, aerial, loose mycelium. This is an important part because when you look at this in the lab, you see these, these are called tuberculate macroconidia. They are diagnostic. You remember in Blaster, it was the yeast cell was diagnostic. Thick wall, wide base of the bud, single bud. These are spores. And that's characteristic and diagnostic. And then how did we get this culture? What does it look like? It's a, it's a yeast pan. We incubated it at 37 degrees. You just take some of the mycelium and smear it on the blood, blood dogger and incubate it. It's not that easy, but essentially that's what you do, and vice versa. You take a little bit of the yeast, put it on the Sabarod's auger, and incubate it at 25 degrees, and they grow the other way. We accept that that's nature. The, uh, in nature, there is a mycelium with all the spores for you to inhale waiting for you, and the yeast invades. This is a wet mount from that he took that culture and made a wet mount. That's what you see. Small yeast around six microns in diameter. The yeast by themselves are not diagnostic. Just to give you an idea, they're slightly oval shaped, two to five, six microns, and 10 to 15 microns for tuberculosis macroconidia. Serology here is, is a little, uh, is, it's a puzzle. Uh, some people will develop antibodies to one item, one antigen, and not to another. And we have uh, three primary tests now. The uh, complement fixation, and you, there are two antigens, one made to the mycelium and one made to the yeast. Some react to one, some to the other. What was the problem I mentioned about complement fixation tests? Do you remember one of the problems with it? It takes a long time to develop. It may take one, two, three months. The immunodiffusion test is, is good. It has two bands. The H band, if you see an H band, that means the patient has active disease. An M band is past infection or due to a skin test. That's why in the first hour I told you we're not using skin tests for diagnosis anymore. Or it could also be part of the present illness. Uh, the EIA test is rather new. It seems to work very well. It detects antibody. But there's an EIA test being developed that detects antigen. And this is good, except it only works in systemic diseases at this point. They're still working on it and refining it. It won't take the asymptomatic or the uh, acute pulmonary infection. It won't identify those. And the trouble we can't get more information on is the fellow who developed this, in most science, you publish your work, and it's disseminated, and everybody tries it, and somebody makes a commercial product. He's making the commercial product himself and won't release how he's doing it. So it's what's called proprietary. But in systemic infections, it's doing good. This is to give you, we had an outbreak in Lawrence, I mentioned. This is one patient, and this gives you an idea. We're doing the latex test, which is not being produced anymore. Uh, most people don't care for it. It comes up very early in the disease. You usually don't see the patient at that time. See one month? and then it drops off very quickly. But usually, like I say, you don't see the patient that early. That's why a lot of people aren't using it. And then this is complement fixation. And the uh, yeast antigen and the mycelial antigen come up a little different, but you still see it takes two or three months to see them, and then it tapers off. This one tapered way down. That one maintained itself. And that's sort of a typical way you'll see the serology.
the drugs for treatment, itraconazole is used for mild cases. Intraconazole is a, a static drug. You know the difference between cytal and static. This just slows it down and lets the body defenses take over, where cytal drugs like amphotericin B, uh, they actually kill off the organisms. Okay, we're going to end that there. Now, this is a mouthful, coccidioidomycosis. The coxy, uh, they first thought that this, there's a, a coxy as an animal protozoan, and that's what they thought it was. The OID means it's similar to, and the mycosis means it's a fungus infection. So that's how that mouthful of name came along. And from the picture, you can see it occurs in the desert southwest. Most of the patients we see here in South Carolina are patients who were in the, uh, usually the Navy stationed in San Diego or the Air Force stationed in Arizona, Southern California, and then they get transferred here at Shaw Air Force Base or one of the uh, marine bases down there, and that's when they get the illness. So even if you're just practicing in South Carolina, you can't chalk this off. We used to have patients who uh, would get it by just traveling through the area, dust, they'd buy blankets or something along the highways. You don't see that much anymore because all the highways are uh, uh, interstates and you can't stop if you wanted to. Uh, but they used to have stands along the highways. People buy a blanket and shake it and out and uh, they get coccidioidomycosis by the time they got home to South Carolina. The organism is coccidioides imitus. And like histoplasmosis, it can come as an acute, benign, self-limiting disease. And in that case, uh, anybody who lives in the Southwest, if you live there about six years, you'll have gone through this. You think you had a bad cold or an influenza like the histoplasmosis. And it can, though, become chronic, malignant, disseminated, and it could almost involve any tissue, but primarily pulmonary disease. You can get spinal fluid infections, meningitis, cutaneous lesions. Again, inhalation primarily, like the others, and inoculation under the same laboratory accidents that I've told you are, or other types of uh, inoculation. Look at those symptoms. Now, the only thing different here from the tuberculosis system, symptoms and the other fungus infections are the arthralgia and the erythema multiforme. They'll get this red ray, rash usually on the legs. And for some reason, females get that more than the males. Joint pains frequently. Pulmonary disease. Now, this fellow isn't giving you the finger. Uh, this is a, uh, or was, a 35-year-old physician, actually, and this was in Mexico City. And they thought he had, uh, was having a heart attack because he had these chest pains. And it turned out he had a pericardial infection with coccidioidomycosis, very rare. But it wasn't until He's pointing to this lesion. I know it doesn't show too well. Until it bursts through there, and they look at the pus with a wet mount, and here they see what we call spherules, which I'll show you in a minute. And then at about the same time, he developed that lesion on his finger. So these are unusual manifestations. The black area and extending down into Mexico uh, is the area of coccidioidomycosis. It's a desert organism. What happens, well, I'll tell you in a minute. This happens to be the same map, old map that had blastomycosis. That's the blastomycosis area. It grows in the desert and it blooms and it gives off all these spores. In the mid 1970s,
I'm going to skip ahead a bit. This is where I changed some of the slides on the new version. Uh, the um, organism has this cycle. This is the soil cycle, and this is the animal or human infection cycle. We start off with these conidia, and these are called arthroconidia. What's important about this is if you look up in here, you'll see the arthroconidia are formed alternately. You see the mycelium, and then space mycelium, and an arthrospore, space and arthrospore. And they're barrel-shaped. And whenever it rains out there, the arthrospores start to grow into a mycelium and produce more arthrospores. An animal or a human comes around, disrupts the soil, and then has these arthrospores. And they go through this other cycle in which they form endospores. We don't have the true yeast form in this. this that's why we'll use the phrase tissue form earlier. It's also the tissue form. This is a spherule, and the spherule breaks down into endospores, and then the endospores are released and break out and start to cycle again in man, or if it's in an animal and the animal dies and is laying in the soil, then it goes on this other cycle, okay? Now let's do this one first. The uh, desert soil. Here, here are the archaeological middens. Do you know what middens are? That's where um, the archaeologists and the start digging up uh, and looking at the trash left behind in uh, ancient civilizations. And a lot of these were archaeological students in uh, Southern California, and they'd be doing digging, and they'd get exposed. After we learned from that, every, all archaeological students in the Southwest wear masks and are respirators when they're digging around. The uh, pottery, again, like people buying pottery along the side of the road full of dust, take it home, wash it out, and inhale the spores. Uh, rodent burrows, cotton. We've had cases, other cases here in South Carolina. That's why I say you can't knock this off. Uh, workers at the mills in Burlington, cotton mills, the cotton came from Arizona, and they're, whatever they do with it, to shred it and take it apart and make cotton cloth out of it, and that would release the spores, and they'd become infected. So we see coccidioidal mycosis here. And then similarly with construction sites, to just the disruption of soil. Now, let me go back to this other slide. In, uh, I can't remember, mid-70s, You see here on this slide, it shows you, it's just in Southern California. It's only since I moved out west that I've gotten to know California. Strange, very strange place. Uh, this, there's a big valley that runs up like this, Central Valley, and that's the hot spot. That's where it was first discovered, and that's where it, it grows. And it's just down in the southern part, although the valley goes up a little further. Uh, that dust storm occurred in 1972 down in Bakersfield, the southern part of the state. This was taken at 30,000 feet. It just so happens the weathermen were chasing this storm. All this dust up there, that's all, all dust up at 30,000 feet in the clouds, deposited up in Northern California, and uh, two months later, here are all these cases of coccidioidal mycosis occurring in a place they didn't expect it. The spores started settling down, and people inhaled them and got infected. Those are those arthrospores. Okay? And this is a spherule. This is exactly what you'll see in tissue. You can even take a piece of tissue and make a KOH mount. Put a drop of KOH, cover slip it, and uh, heat it a little bit. And this is what you'll see. Spherules, not yeast. Again, the material depending on what you find. Uh, incidentally, uh, spinal fluid. It's very difficult to cure. It takes a lot of high-powered 
drugs and infectious disease people to cure the uh, meningitis. This is a slow-growing mycelium, white, compact. Uh, this is probably a three or four week culture. Remember the other three or four week culture of histoplasma filled up the plate. This is probably about three weeks old. And when we look at that, we see these barrel shaped conidia. That's important, arthroconidia, barrel shaped. And other fungi will produce these, but the alternating sequence of these is uh, peculiar to Coccidioides imidus. Even in the lab, uh, before we had any safety procedures uh, 25, 30, 40 years ago, you were very careful when you were. In fact, in most labs, you would not, if you saw a plate with this growing, nobody was allowed to open it. You had to go to a special lab that knew what they were doing with it. But it's very aerosolized very easily. This is a tissue section of spherules. And you can see here are the spherules. Here's one that's fairly empty. Uh, these are loose endospores that have already uh, extruded from the spherule. That's a histopathology slide. You'd never know that this was lung tissue, would you? Now, we have four serological tests. Complement fixation. What's the problem with complement fixation? Cross reacts, blastomycosis, histoplasma, and coccidioidomycosis. Whenever a physician requests fungal serology, you'll, you do all the complement fixation antigens, histoblasto, coxy. Immunodiffusion is good. Complement fixation is slow to come up, and this is the other diseases. Immunodiffusion, two to three weeks, you'll see some bands. Uh, slide agglutination is a rapid test done in many hospitals in um, the southwest. And the EIA, again, is still fairly new, but looks good. And a lot of the hospitals now have uh, EIA capacity, so they're doing EIAs. You know, it used to be easy to talk about this because Whenever we talk, let's say up till about 10 years ago, we'd just say the drug of choice is amphotericin B, period. But now the uh, infectious disease people are very selective because amphotericin B is a terrible drug. And fluconazole is working pretty good in mild cases and itraconazole. And they grade these cases all sorts of ways and, uh, and make these decisions. But fluconazole, itraconazole, or rather mild cases, and then back to amphoterrible for uh, severe infections. Okay, that's all on coccidioidomycosis. Any questions on coccidioidomycosis? You're going to see it here if you practice here. Yes? Pardon? My husband's family's from New York. Oh, uh huh. And he went out there and he never. Uh, did you hear what she said? Her husband's from New Mexico, and he, he was out there rock hunting and got uh, yeah, an illness. Yeah, he got terribly sick, and nobody else around him got sick. Yeah. But he was absolutely sick. Well, that, that, that's, that's very likely what it was. Yeah, um, How long ago was it? Um, this was, um, I would say, in April or May. Oh, recently? Yeah. Well, he, could, he would probably, he would still have, if you really wanted to follow it through, would still have serological reactions. Oh, yeah. So you could check it that way. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's very likely what it was. In fact, he, you remind them because in the future, it's possible they're going to see this on x ray. They're going to see a remnant of it. And they say, oh, you make the tumor first thing, you know? And so you keep that in mind if something happens in the future. Because a lot of them will have a residual histo and blasto too. Histo probably the most that has residual uh, pulmonary calcifications, but coccidioidomycosis does too. Okay. Uh, this is para. 
coccidioidal mycosis. And this disease occurs mostly in the Latin American countries. Now, I'm saying Latin American for a purpose, we'll point out later. Um, because it occurs in Mexico. And where is Mexico? What, what part of the, what continent is Mexico? Huh? It's North America. Most people want to call it South America or Central America, but Mexico is North America. But it occurs in Mexico, too. The way we see these cases is just like this young lady's husband. They're working down there or playing down there. But what happens, the problem here is this disease takes anywhere 10, 15, 20 years before it's manifested. So these people are back here in the United States. And unless you question them specifically about their occupation, you'll never make that diagnosis unless the lab is good enough to do it for you. It's a chronic granulomatous disease of the lungs, mucous membranes, skin, and lymph nodes. It's a little different than the others. It's the same pulmonary infection, but it's mostly muco, uh, muco, mucosa, and the mucosal membranes in the mouth that you see this often, and the lymph nodes are prominent. Now, here's a patient. See that lesion? These must be the... That one was on my new, new set that we didn't get, or I thought we didn't get. Um, this is a lesion on the lip. It's the mucosa. Now, again, this is an important fact. You see this? This is a wet mount from, say, take that lesion on the mount and make a wet mount. These organisms are large, and I'll show you better pictures, but they have multiple buds. And you see there's not that wide base. You remember blastomycosis had this wide base. And these are narrow base. I'll show you better. There's, you see a good narrow base when I show you a histological section of it and multiple buds. Um, okay, see, beginning in North America here. On down. Brazil probably has the highest amount but I don't think it's because there's more uh, paracoccidioides there. I think it's because they have a very good uh, medical system and a lot of uh, research, and they're out there investigating this disease quite a bit. But Brazil and Colombia and Venezuela have a, a large amount of it. It has been isolated from soil once or twice, but uh, not enough, people aren't convinced, but since it's similar to the other fungi, that's probably where it is. It's just we haven't developed good enough techniques to isolate it, just like blastomycosis. We haven't, uh, coccidioidomycosis, you remember cryptococcosis in the pigeons? Uh, Histococci and crypto, you can get from the soil very easily. Uh, they usually... It's a little more than a direct culture. But anyway, uh, with uh, uh, blastomycosis, you've got to make a solution, inject it into mice, and then the mice get ill, and you culture their organism. But this one, it's not been, but it's probably soil. And it has been isolated for armadillos, so I think armadillos play a role. Where do armadillos occur in the U.S.? Texas and Florida, exactly. Very good. Are you from Texas or Florida? Uh. <laughs> Are there some in South Carolina? Oh, I didn't know that. Where? Down near Hilton Head or something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So be careful when you catch your armadillos. Are they good eating? I know somebody, some people eat them. Okay. Here's a triad. And this is characteristic. You, uh, frequently, these patients in Central America wound up in um, uh, TB sanitarium for the same reason our patients with histoplasmosis wound up in a sanitarium. Uh, but as 
the physicians uh, and microbiologists and mycologists became a little more smarter and learned a little more. And I'm saying like in the, it wasn't that early, maybe late 50s, 60s, they began to see if they had a pulmonary lesion, but they all ha also had cervical adenopathy, and if they were missing some teeth, then they promptly searched for coccidioides, paracoccidioides. Uh, the pulmonary lesion, just like TB, X-ray, uh, the cervical adenopathy, here's a patient, this is a sanitarium, typical sanitarium uniform. Here's his lymph node sticking out. Edentulous, and you all know what that means, no teeth. His mucous membrane, he did not have, remember the first one I showed you, all this area was all swollen up. This fellow just lost all his teeth because the organism invades the uh, mucosa. And I mentioned it's a prolonged incubation period, 10 to 20 years. Typically we get engineers that worked in Venezuela 10 or 15 years ago and they come in and they get ill. And that's the way most of the U.S. cases occur. Again, clinical material, depending on how the disease presents itself. At 25 degrees, it's a white, dense mycelium and very slow growing. It almost sticks to the, to the medium. It's hard to pull it off. It's a, it's a, a glabrous type of growth. Here are the colonies. A nondescript mycelium, when you look at it microscopically, it does have these spores or, or conidia, and they're usually on a short, see that's a short stalk, here's a short stalk, and that's how we distinguish uh, them. But this is a yeast form growth. This is the characteristic, this is the important part of this disease. The uh, fungi, and this is also a wet mound. Can you see that very narrow where the bud comes off? And of course you can see the multiple buds, okay? And they're much larger than blastomyces. Now it can be often when you're looking in the lab, they only see these. You don't see the big spherules. You just see the, they're not spherules, excuse me, these are large yeast forms. If you don't see the mother cell like that, it can be confused and look like any other yeast. It can look like cryptococcus. It can look like blastomyces. It could look like large histo. So you've got to look and look and look for this characteristic captain's wheel is what they usually call it. Here's a histopathological sign, and here's an almost perfect one, narrow base, thin wall, multiple buds. The immunodiffusion tests were developed in uh, Colombia, South America, and they are good, very good. Come up in two to three weeks, fairly rapid and sensitive and specific. Uh, Amphotericin B, again, sulfonamide trimethoprin. I've asked a few of my infectious disease colleagues every once in a while, why does that work? These aren't bacteria, those are antibacterials. They don't know, but it does work. But now the antifungal agent, intraconazole, is being used a lot more and seems to be uh, very effective. It hasn't been around long enough to see what the relapse rates are. But so far, it's, it seems to be doing very well. Okay. Yes? I, I didn't quite hear you. When they come back here. Oh, no, no, no. We, we don't see the teeth coming out. These people have had it for a long, years and years. Yeah. Uh, no, they get an acute phase when you see them here. It's a pulmonary disease or it may be an abscess of some sort, and that's why, that's why it's, uh, it's confusing. 
Uh, I want to take just a few minutes uh, to tell you about our Lawrence County outbreak, which I just put some slides together from back in 1969, because it demonstrates a lot of epidemiology, clinical, lab, all of uh, it's for histoplasmosis, but pretty much the others. Jason, uh, Justin, could you put on another CD for me? And also, the other reason I want to relate it to you is because the key initiate, uh, diagnosis, initial diagnosis was made here at the VA hospital. Um, it was the fall, early fall, of uh, 1968 or 69, uh, when a patient came down here and uh, acute illness, and he was in respiratory distress, and he died uh, within a couple of days of getting here. And uh, we were looking at some of his specimens. Oh, yeah, you got Okay, good. You found it all. Uh, and... Um, I can't remember the old doc's name. There was only one pathologist here. And he did everything by himself. And um, I, can't, I can't, I don't remember the details, how we came to the conclusion. But anyway, here's Lawrence County. Anybody from Lawrence County? No, huh? Gee. Um, well, this was for other people. So I had to tell them that Carolina went from the seashore to the mountains. And here is the... Lawrence County area, cane break. There's a big cane break along Country Road. This is not the same one, but there are a lot up in that area. Because this one, they wanted to clear, that's the same slide I showed you before to give you an idea how high these things are and how thick. You can't, some of them, you can't even walk through them to get your samples. It's very difficult. Uh, it turns out that they were, um, this old man, and he, was an old man, he was about 80 at the time, um, had this old house there, and big starlings, the starlings came in every night, they make a racket every night, if you've ever heard it, they're terrible, the noise they make. And then in the morning, the same thing when they took off. So he had hired these two guys to plow it. These two guys were one and two here, 41 and 44 year old brothers with a, um, a plow and a lot of equipment. Uh, they, one man had these two sons. These next three old men were standing on the road watching. And this is the owner of the house, 80 years old. And these two were sons of the initial case. This is the initial case. Here's the time they worked. They worked two days here. You know, one hour, eight hours the second day. They weren't there a long time. The old men, there they are, were watching, you know, an hour, 20, 30 minutes. Okay? And this boy, which one of them? This boy only brought his father up there his lunch. That's all he did. Uh, these are the days of onset of illness. This is extremely rapid. We were able to put all this together uh, very easily. Uh, and you don't usually have this opportunity. Usually it takes a couple of weeks to get infected. You see all these? This man, seven days later, was dead. Okay, here is a slide from somebody, I can't remember, we made a tissue impression from, uh, I don't remember with lung or liver. This looks more like it might be liver cells. You see, the, here's the histoplasma capsulatum. See it? Who in there? A uh, white mold, which we grew very easily and had the chlamydia spores to identify it, grew some yeast. And uh, this is another, uh, these are polys with yeast in them. This is the site. The three men, old men, stood here to watch them plowing, digging up. Here's the old house, and the 80 year old man never left the porch. Here's the shed. This was all cane break, and they piled. This is where they piled it up. These are piles. These are the places we sampled, and the ones with the stars are where we isolated the organism. This is the old house. It doesn't show out very well, but a very, very old house. And this is where the cane break was, back behind here. There's a shed there, which 
we isolated. Here's that shed. Those are the piles of cane break. By the time we got there, they were dried up pretty much. This is cane break at the side of the shed, and that's the house there, very old. And there's more cane break piled up there. But anyway, uh, this man died. This man was pulmonary crippled the rest of his life. These guys fairly recovered, the two younger men. The old boys said, Doc, I had flu. It was terrible. And that's all they had, flu-like illness. Uh, these three, uh, we call a primary, okay, these two, I guess he was symptomatic. These two are asymptomatic. Uh, all they had, though, really, he said he had a little illness, not much. Uh, we followed them serologically. That's why we knew they were infected. They had no illness at all. Days after exposure when they became ill. See, this is very quick. It's usually not this quick. On the fourth day, the fifth day, and then the seventh day. Uh, okay, these are the uh, results. Dead, lung disease the rest of his life, well, well. Dead from natural causes, okay. He was well, he was well. He died in an auto accident. He died of natural causes, the 80-year-old man. And the young kid died in an auto accident also. Anyway, that's, that's the way it is. Oh, I, want, I think I have some serological pictures. Uh, this just tells you that... C68, 68, 70, 72, 75, 77, and we were still getting positive samples. It'll stay that way all, yeah. I think more likely he didn't breathe that much because I, as I recall, the Starlings had only been there about three years. And I think if he, we, H and M bands, the uh, immunodiffusion was just coming in then, and we were using it, and he would have shown M bands, and I don't think he did if he had had it before. Oh, here, here's the, uh, uh, yes, yeah, uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. Well, there's a possibility he did have M bands. Well, that's a possibility. But I, again, since they were only there about three years, I don't think so because the droppings have to be worked into the soil, then they have to be seeded, and then they have to grow and all that. So I really don't think so. Uh, and this is, I, I was copying these from some old slides I had. Uh, here you've got a 1 to 16 complement fix in three or four weeks one and a half weeks, I mean one and a half months. And, and you can see that this is the mycelial form antigen that's spotty. This is the yeast form antigen, and this, most of these cases they came up earlier. Uh, Complement fixation, see the cross-reaction blastomycosis. See, look at how high that is. So that's why you gotta be careful how you interpret these. Now, uh, let's skip that. You've seen that. Oh, we did skin tests. Here's a positive skin test on, uh, I think there were eighth grade students on two schools right, right nearby. And what we found was uh, Great Court Owings, 240 students. We had 200. Look at that participation. We sent maps home with them to draw a line where, uh, mark their house on the map. It had every house on it. And we had good participation in both schools. And 88% were skin test positive, 68% were skin test positive. Uh, this is a composite, total of 30%. Oh, uh, in those studies I told you about naval recruits in the beginning, from that they learned that you can get false reactions uh, that were not positive. When you got false reactions, this is a skin test, the induration in millimeters and how many people had it. So here are your larger skin. If you had a bell curve like this, that was all real, true results. When you had false positives, the curve would begin up here. You have all these low 
uh, reactions, and then they would drop off like that. So these were real histoplasmin positive. All those kids were exposed. That's it. I just thought it shows a lot. It puts it into real life for you.